and announcements. First of all, the memorandum for correspondence that you've been provided uh, concerning this briefing as well as the fact sheet. I understand that uh, we don't have enough copies for everyone. We are making additional copies. They will be available uh, well, during the briefing or certainly afterwards. I'd also like to mention to you that between this briefing and our regularly scheduled uh, Department of Defense news briefing, there will be a 10-minute break so that those of you that want to file can do so. I realize 10 minutes isn't all that much time. Uh, I would also like to mention that pictures of the uh, South Pole of the Moon as well as some other shots of the uh, Clementine uh, moon craft are available on Defense Link. We put them up there this morning. And now it gives me a great pleasure to be able to introduce to you Dr. Dwight Dustin. Dr. Dustin is the Assistant Deputy for Technology of the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization. As such, he is responsible for all research and development for missile defense. Uh, he will introduce experts associated with the project who will brief you on their roles in this remarkable discovery of water ice on our moon. Dr. Dustin. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, and uh, I see by the large number of people here today that uh, this is uh, kind of beyond our wildest expectations in terms of the interest, both from scientific and the military community, so I welcome you all here today. Two and a half years ago, we were here in this very room to talk about the launch and the successful image transmissions from the Clementine satellite. Uh, the Clementine satellite represented a revolution in s uh, spacecraft engineering uh, because of the major cost reductions and schedule reductions that were uh, part of this project. Um, today, we're here again uh, to talk about one of the many great discoveries that have come out of the many, many imagery, data, and, and other measurements that were made by the very advanced technologies on board of Clementine. Uh, we're very proud of this particular measurement because it represents something which we think is of very large importance and has a big impact on the scientific community, as well as our understanding of the solar system, as well as exploration and the future of, uh, of humankind in space as well. Um, the Clementine project, uh, first of all, let me tell you, was a, a joint project, something very, uh, very good took place in the government. The Ballistic Missile Defense Organization uh, was in charge of the project. The Naval Research Laboratory designed and built the satellite. Lawrence Livermore Laboratory built the sensor package that was on board. And uh, finally, NASA contributed by support, financial support of the scientific team that analyzed the data, as well as providing to us the use of the Deep Space Network array of antennas to receive the transmissions back uh, from Clementine. So this was truly a joint government operation between many arms of the U.S. federal government. So we're here today to talk about this discovery uh, that uh, it took us a year to analyze this data and a year to get it published in Science Magazine. And so who, what I've done today is I brought three experts who represent uh, very different aspects of the Clementine satellite to help me describe this today. Uh, with me from uh, the, Na the National Reconnaissance Organization is uh, Colonel Pedro Rustan. Pedro was the... Um, project manager of the Clementine Satellite Program, and he'll be discussing immediately after me for a few minutes. He will discuss uh, the as some of the aspects of the satellite and why we this mission was done and what it meant to the Department of Defense, which I'm sure is a question that many of you have in your mind. Uh, following that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Stuart Nozette from Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. Stu was the person who envisioned the ICE experiment, how to do the detection using the bi-static radar, and he will talk a little bit about that for three minutes. And then finally ending up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Paul Spudis from the Lunar and Planetary Institute. Paul is an internationally recognized expert in lunar geology. He's a geologist, and he will handle the scientific aspects of the discovery and what that impact is for, uh, for everybody in the future. I'm sure you all would like to know uh, where this is all going and where it might lead, and he will be glad to speculate on that. So let me introduce, uh, let me turn it over to Colonel Rustan, who will talk about the Clementine mission. Thank you very much, Dwight. I'd just like to say that uh, why the Clementine mission was done and why the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization and the relevance that it has. Back in the late 1980s, the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization, at that time the Strategic Defense Initiative Organization, built a lot of advanced technologies. This technology were about an order of magnitude smaller than anything that was available at the time. The reason why this technology were developed is because we needed to do a space defense. You know, there was a great emphasis at that time of a space ballistic defense that we needed to build a small satellite to provide space defense. So many cameras, many navigation and guidance systems were built along those lines. 
At the time I got to the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization in 1989, you know, it was very clear that there was not going to be a, a deployment of a space defenses. So what we try to do here is think about a way to demonstrate these technologies so the rest of the community could use it. Otherwise, technology will be sitting at shelf somewhere, and the commercial and the military community will not have access to it. So the Clementine, the purpose of the mission was to integrate the most advanced technologies that we have developed at the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization in a compact package and test it. You know, testing that package, the best way to do it, especially with multi-spectral images, 11 different images, is to put it together in a small 500 pounds mission. So you have here a 500 pound spacecraft. And you put that spacecraft together and you fly it out in a place that you can collect useful information. And after a lot of discussions, you know, working with NASA and Department of Defense, we decided to fly the mission around the moon because we needed to demonstrate this advanced multispectral imaging technologies that we have developed. So there were six cameras and a laser altimeter, you know, mounted together in this payload. And uh, the mission was put together in 22 months at a total cost of $75 million which by any sense of the imagination is a revolution. Mission of this magnitude will have cost at least $300 million in those days and even today. So what we wanted to do is demonstrate a faster, cheaper, and better strategy. A lot of people had spoken about faster, cheaper, and better, but nobody had actually implemented, put it together in a way that actually makes sense. So here's a mission put together in a very short period of time you know, with the most advanced technologies and actually deployed to get not only the usefulness from the military side, so what the technology had to offer, but also scientific information that will help the community at large. So my next partner, my deputy at that time, Dr. Nosset, will discuss a specific details concerning the uh, the mission that we're discussing today, today, which is the biostatic radar, you know, that's something that was thought out after the spacecraft was orbiting around the moon. The spacecraft collected 1.8 million images of the moon, you know, and when the time, uh, when the spacecraft was orbiting the moon, the idea came up that it might be possible to look in deep into the craters in the South Pole about the possibility of ice on the moon, and that's the way the, the experiment was conceived. This was not designed, the spacecraft was not designed for that purpose. The spacecraft was designed to test all this advanced technology. There were 23 new technologies never tested before, and each one of these technologies was about an order of magnitude less than, than what had been done previously, all put together in this very compact spacecraft in a very short period of time. So I will pass the, the podium to my deputy, uh, Dr. Nosset, who will describe the actual radar experiment. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, as uh, Pedro mentioned, uh, this experiment was really an experiment of opportunity. I think we had maybe thought about doing it before the spacecraft was launched, but we had so many tasks to accomplish to get the spacecraft to the moon. I think any mention of you know, extra experiments once we got there were sort of uh, dismissed, uh, considering the, uh, the, uh, all the problems we had overcome to get it there. I think once we got to the moon and were in lunar orbit, people had speculated since the early 60s of the possibility that ice might collect in the permanently shadowed craters at the lunar poles. Unfortunately, until Clementine, no one had really taken a very good look at the lunar poles and weren't, weren't sure really how much permanent shadow was there. I think uh, the subsequent speaker to me, uh, Dr. Spudas, can elaborate on this, but one of the first things we saw early was that it looked like at the South Pole had quite a bit of permanent shadow. Uh, unfortunately, by definition, since it's permanently shadowed, nothing shines in there, there's no way to illuminate. Uh, what's down there. We didn't have anything on the spacecraft, we thought, until uh, we thought that, well, we do have something on the spacecraft we can use to shine, the uh, communications antenna. And uh, by static radar, I'll just refer to this chart uh, briefly, basically all that means is the transmitter and the receiver are at different places. And so what we were able to do is use the spacecraft antenna like a flashlight and point the antenna into the lunar south pole. Oops, I've got my pointer here. The uh, key thing to looking to detect ice is ice reflects radar waves differently than rock. Rock basically acts sort of like a smooth surface, like a mirror effectively, and bounces them back with one bounce. The wave doesn't really go very far into the rock. Ice is very transparent and it's what's called a low loss material. It, the radar wave can actually penetrate in, into there and actually gets bounced around and rattled around and can bounce back like a roadside reflector. 
So basically what we were looking for is as the spacecraft came around in this angle, as it all lined up, you'd see a backflash, basically, of uh, radar signal right at that point. And the uh, other thing that happens, and this is somewhat of a technical term, is the polarization changes. The, the spacecraft transmits a wave of a certain polarization. Ordinarily, pure rock would flip the polarization 180 degrees. Because ice is transparent, the wave bounces around, some of it comes back uh, with the same polarization. And this effect has been observed on Mercury, on a number of places in the solar system where uh, ice is known to be, and it is considered somewhat diagnostic. And we see that effect very cor much correlated to this angle, so as this angle gets small. So we were able to take four measurements, uh, two measurements at the South Pole, two measurements at the North Pole. And one of the measurements, which was the measurement that uh, basically spotlighted the, the permanent shadowed area, did show this polarization effect. The other measurement at the South Pole, which did not illuminate permanent shadowed area, illuminated normal uh, lunar surface, did not, and as a control. And the two uh, measurements we made at the North Pole also did not show this effect. And Clementine showed that the North Pole had much, much less permanent shadow. So it appears the effect that we saw is what's predicted uh, for this type of uh, radar signature, and it seemed to be very much isolated to the South Pole. And in fact, uh, there is a graph over there that shows that we actually tried to uh, segregate the dark area in, and really isolated the fact that that return really is isolated to the dark area, and it is suggestive of, of uh, ice. So with that, uh, to talk about the scientific aspects of this, I'll turn it over to Dr. Paul Spudis of the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Houston. Thank you, Stu. I'd like to briefly discuss sort of two aspects to this uh, amazing discovery. First of all, from a scientific viewpoint, what does this mean? And secondly, from a utilization viewpoint, what good is it? From the scientific viewpoint, you've got to ask yourself, where could ice come from on the moon? We know from the Apollo samples that the moon is extremely dry. And in fact, all the Apollo samples studied today show no evidence whatsoever for any water or any kind of hydrous phase being present in the lunar interior. So I think the idea that ice, that water may have outgassed from the moon, from the lunar interior over time, probably isn't the case. I think the answer is when you look at the pictures of the moon, you see huge amounts of craters. And we know after studying the moon for 30 years that most of these craters were formed by comets and asteroids. Now comets are made up predominantly of water ice. That is the dominant component of a comet. There are other volatile components. There's methane, there's ammonia, there are even organic molecules that are present in comets. All these Volatile elements, elements that have very low boiling points, are concentrated in comets because comets formed in the outermost part of the solar system. And Jupiter has perturbed them over geologic time into the inner solar system where they hit the moon. Now, the significance of the dark area becomes apparent because as a comet hits the moon, that water vapor hangs around the moon as a cloud. If any water vapor gets into a cold trap, which, by the way, is only about 40 degrees centigrade above absolute zero, so they're extremely cold, if a water molecule gets into the cold trap, it cannot get out again. It doesn't have enough thermal energy to hop out, and there's no way to knock it out. So over time, over three billion years, you could accumulate a significant amount of water ice in the dark area. So what does this mean scientifically? It means that for the first time, we know on the moon that we have a preserved record of the cometary impact flux over geologic time. So we can go there, study this deposit, and actually understand possibly how is the cometary flux changed with time. Has the source areas of comets over time changed? Do they migrate inward with time? All these are questions we don't know, but the answers are on the moon, and they're on the moon in this dark area. Now, the second aspect I'd like to discuss is the utilization part of this. As you know, as you're probably aware, water is probably one of the most valuable strategic objects, uh, strategic materials that we can find in the solar system. Uh, not only does it produce water for human life support, both water to drink and to disassociate into oxygen and hydrogen to breathe, or uh, rather oxygen to breathe, but water is also a very good rocket propellant. When you electrolyze water into hydrogen and oxygen and you liquefy them, you produce basically the same fuel that the space shuttle uses in, the, in its main engines, liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. So for the first time, we now know that there are deposits of water at the south pole of the moon that are there apparently uh, uh, accessible and ready to use for this purpose, both to support human life and to produce rocket fuel. And finally, I'll, I'll point out one thing on this diagram. Uh, if you look at the very center of this mosaic of the South Pole, you'll see there's a slightly lit area right at the center of the crosshair. It's just at about the South Pole. It turns out that this is an area that is uh, this area right here. 
just right near the South Pole, is lit, and it's in close proximity to all this darkness. Now, it turns out we've studied this particular area over the course of a lunar month, and it turns out that this area is also illuminated 85% of the time, and it's surrounded by areas that are in near permanent darkness. Now, the significance of that is if you were to go to this spot on the moon, you could use thermal or you could use solar panels for electrical power for the duration of the mission because the sun would effectively never set. It would always be above the horizon. It might dip below a mountain for a, a few hours of the 708 hour lunar day. So it, you may be looking in this photograph at possibly the most valuable piece of real estate in the solar system. It's certainly a place where we can go, utilize the resources, and live in an area that's actually benign environmentally on the moon. You want to talk about yes, um, the use of uh, uh, indigenous uh, materials in space has been studied for a long time. You know we've known that uh, from the Apollo results that there's hydrogen in the lunar regolith, and and it's pr produced there by the solar wind and plants it on the grains, but it's present in extremely tiny amounts, less than about 50 parts per million in most of the soils. In this area, the water that's there is probably present in abundances between one and 10 percent. And that's a significant amount of, uh, of, of water. It's also water that's easily recoverable. If we were to recover this and, and, and electrolyze it, disassociate it into hydrogen and oxygen, we would actually be able to build a filling station on the moon. So one of the, one of the reasons space travel is so expensive is that we have to lug everything we need up with us from Earth orbit, this huge gravity well. By having materials that we can use on the moon to refuel that's already in Earth orbit, we save an enormous amount of weight and an enormous amount of cost. So the significance of this uh, to future exploration of the solar system is, is, is very, very profound. And with that, I'll turn it back to Dwight. Thank you very much, Paul. I'd like to throw it open to questions now, if we could. <coughs> Sir, how strong is the indication that you have? We spoke of an indication and a hint uh, from reflected uh, rays. How accurate are these readings? How really indicative they are? are they of water, or are they just the first sign? We have the one measurement that indicates basically the predicted response. So I'd say the principle, if we were, I would say we would certainly have to have more measurements. The other thing that's very, uh, very highly suggestive is it's very highly correlated with the permanent shadow. So we're saying we're seeing the effect correlated with the permanent shadow. Does that mean there is ice? Well, there's something that's ref, uh, ref, re reflecting radar signals like ice. But your geologist said it was ice. Highly likely. Can I follow ice. up? Uh, there may be other stuff mixed in with it, what carbon other dioxide things, and other what things like that. What other things would give the polarization effect that you're reading now as possible water? Well, we looked at the possibility, uh, you know, that it could be a funny arrangement of rocks and other things, but again, it really was so highly correlated with that angle and so highly localized to the South Pole that, you know, it's it, it most likely explanation is something that is low loss, and ice is the most likely uh, thing. Can you go over the uh, 1 to 10 percent again, how that, I don't understand the difference between that and what's in the bottom of the crater and where the 1 to 10 percent is? What we could measure as far as the abundance of it is we have a, the radar footprint is a certain area. You know, what we can show is basically the amount of signature we get back assuming that the ice on the moon reflects the way the ice on Mercury does, which has been measured. We can estimate a percentage of the area that is, quote, pure ice. And uh, that we estimated that to be about you know less than three tenths of a percent of the area that we illuminated. So that's like a hundred square kilometers. And that, so that the area that you illuminated is that in the bottom of this crater? Right. Or we that? illuminated the whole area. This this whole area was illuminated. So of the area we illuminated, we estimated about a third of the area was permanently shadowed. This is all in the paper, by the way. It's in the, all in the science paper. And so of that that a percentage is uh, reflecting like like ice. So it's incorrect to talk of one pond or one lake that you, you really see right. what could be a variety. Well, and in fact, if you look over at one of the images, actually, this is actually hinted at from the ground. People actually had measured this on the ground and seen little speckly areas. But they couldn't go through the angle because you can't, you can't measure the angle from the ground because you're all at one point. And they see little speckly areas all around this, this crater. This is right at the South Pole. And so what was suggested is by doing this bi-static measurement, we saw the very highly angular dependence of it. And that is very characteristic of something like, like ice. Could somebody so. address uh, why this 
announcement is coming from the Pentagon, why uh, uh, this is a, a, a Pentagon <coughs> project, and if there's suggests in any way any military use or contemplation of the use of the moon? Uh, the reason we did the experiment uh, in the first place, as Colonel Rustan said, was to highlight and test these advanced technologies that we and other military organizations had been developing over the years. Um, typically we test in the missile defense business, we test our sensors against targets. Uh, this was a low budget enterprise and so we decided to use a target that Mother Nature had put up for us, uh, that was the moon. Uh, we could get totally adequate testing of all our sensors and our laser radar using the moon as opposed to paying millions of dollars of taxpayers money for uh, targets that we would put up directly. So it was literally a target of opportunity. Exactly. And what comes to, but, and what happened to the, where is the program that happened to? Where is what? Where is Clementine now? Um, the spacecraft, as you know, from the name Clementine, is only supposed to be uh, here for a short period of time and be lost and gone forever. So it was intended for a very short period of time after these lunar missions uh, did a rendezvous with the Earth and shortly after, the, after that was shifted by the, by the moon's gravity and continue a, a flight which will bring it back near the Earth in about ten, nine years from now. So it's, a, it's in a 11 years total flight around the moon, around the earth, around the sun. So basically it's moving like a little planet around the sun and it will bring it back close to us to, uh, in about eleven, about nine years, uh, two years since uh, it left us, so it will be another nine years before it's back. But it's, it's not useful right now. The, the, mission, the mission is finished. But unlike its namesake, it's not lost and gone forever. It will be back? It will be back, but it's not a use. It's not. It's not a useful spacecraft anymore. What are the um, What are the implications of this discovery for um, future Pentagon-funded uh, research missions? Uh, Clementine Two, for example. Would you? Uh, Clementine Two is supposed to go to an asteroid. Would you consider tweaking that to maybe? Uh, visit the moon with these penetrators that are supposed to fly on that spacecraft? I can answer your question in two ways. First of all, Clementine II is not a, a ballistic missile defense organization project, so it's kind of beyond the scope of us to be talking about it here today. So I would defer you to the Air Force, who has the responsibility for the project and what they intend to do with Clementine II. I will say, however, that we consider it of imperative importance to maintain the dual use aspects of all the military missions we do, if that's possible. Uh, commercial and civilian applications of the technologies we develop for the Defense Department are extremely important, just as our economic security is, import as is important as our national security. So in any missions we do in the future, we will always look to civilian and commercial applications of the military technology. What comes next? Uh, now, you think you may have found ICE. Uh, <coughs> is there a plan to actually send something, another spacecraft up, to dig up a piece of it? And secondly, uh, does your supposed find now uh, lead to any new missions to the moon, yours, NASA's, or anybody else? Okay, there, there are no specific plans for a mission to follow up on this discovery as of right now. However, uh, by coincidence, there happens to be a mission going to the moon in October of 1997, and that's a NASA mission. It's called Lunar Prospector. It's the first in their discovery series, their, their small spacecraft series. It will go and orbit the moon for a year, and on that spacecraft will be instruments that, that should be able to confirm or negate this discovery. So if, if we're mistaken, we should know from the results of that mission. But uh, the instrument uh, that it carries is a neutron spectrometer, which bas basically measures the presence of hydrogen. And so we should know very quickly after that spacecraft gets there whether this is really ice or not. Uh, if I could ask you to address this to the average person who's probably <coughs> listening to this news conference and saying, well, what exactly is it that you're announcing? Have you found ice? number one, and number two, what is the military significance of this? It sounds as though the military is able now to see beneath the earth, so it might be able to find, for instance, the bunkers for Saddam Hussein. Could you address you both those handle points? The first one. I'll handle the other. Well, yes, the answer is we, we think we have found ice. That is, that is the answer. Uh, we're not positive, but uh, it, the indications are that this response that we got in the radar signature is consistent with ice. And it's exactly the same that we see on other places in the solar system where we know there to be ice. So to, the, the flat answer to that first question is yes, we are announcing the discovery of ice. And the second half? Uh, the second half is what are the military significance? Uh, I think I would be, um, 
I don't want to go too far in, in placing more uh, importance on the actual discovery of ice for the military um, than, than I could really say. However, what is of importance is that we've learned how to take advanced technologies these new sensors, uh, the laser radar that we flew uh, on board were very innovative batteries of, uh, on, a, on a very advanced onboard co uh, computer. Uh, all of these things are ex of extreme importance to the military uh, for future satellites that we may put in orbit for a whole host of applications, communications, um, surveillance, etc. Um, so for the military's point of view, um, the discovery of ice perhaps is not as important as the fact that all the instruments and the advanced technologies that we put up all worked and did their job very well and survived. and. Uh, and really uh, were space qualified for use in other applications. But that doesn't actually end. The military significance would be the fact that you would be able to see beneath the ground. That is, that you'd have a better 3D picture. You'd be able to see, for instance, Saddam Hussein bunkers. I would, uh, I, I would not say that that was demonstrated by this particular experiment, no. I'd, oh. I'd be very hesitant to say that. Is that like a leading to it? Is, it? is that part of the significance of this, the way that you're able to see beneath the ground. We, we've, we are learning every day how to use our sensors, both active and passive sensors, in new ways to do the kind of things that you're talking about. However, I wouldn't misconstrue that as emerging in any significant way from this particular experiment. How far were the Apollo landings from this spot? Excuse me. <laughs> how far were the Apollo landings from this spot, and did the Apollo landings make a mistake by not looking in this area in the first place? No, the Apollo landings were all close to the equator. The farthest away from the equator that we got on Apollo 15 was 26 degrees, and this is at 90 degrees south. And that was designed primarily for safety reasons. On Apollo, they wanted a free return trajectory in case there was a problem with the spacecraft. The astronauts would just loop around the moon and come back. So it wasn't a mistake. It was it, they were sent to the equ equator by design. Can I get clear on what you think this would look like if you could go right down and see it? Would you see? Fairly large, a uh, fairly large pond here. Other ponds all over the place. Some ice in crevices and rocks. What no, you, do you, you, think would, you, would you would you would probably see. First of all, you wouldn't see anything because you'd be in the dark. But if you had a flashlight and you illuminated the surface, you would see a surface that looked not unlike any place else on the moon. But if you were to dig down into that and pull it up, you would find that there would be ice crystals contained in the interstices between the dust grains. So it would, it's, not, it's not a sheet or a pond. It's not an ice rink on the moon. It's basically ice mixed into the dirt. All right, what's the presumptive volume of it then, and how did you discern that? As I mentioned, what we can tell from looking at the uh, radar return is roughly the area that uh, is uh, covered by this, assuming it reflects ice like ice on Mercury making that assumption. That's been well looked at. And then in order to see this backscatter effect, this, this uh, uh, you know, road sign reflector effect, uh, it's estimated that we have to see some number of wavelengths of our radar into, into the ice. And in reviewing the paper, uh, several of the reviewers posited we, we probably need to see somewhere between 50 and 100 wavelengths. So our wavelength is about uh, six inches. So it, at the thickest case, it's roughly uh, 50 uh, feet. And, and, yeah, but what, and that translates to what in volume? Um, we were very conservative in the press release, but if you take basically 100 square kilometers by f roughly 50 feet, you get a volume of something like a quarter of a cubic mile. I think it's on that order. Can you it's, a, it's a considerable amount, but it's not you know, a huge glacier or anything yeah, like that. Can that with something you know? Of course, uh, it's, a, it's a lake. I think, yeah, you know, it's a modest sized lake. Small lake. But it's a dirt lake. Uh, it's right. A mixture it's of mixed, dirt. mixed in. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, dirty, uh, dirty uh, lake. Uh, this is <coughs> from Korean Broadcasting System. If the existence of water and uh, micro life uh, is eventually confirmed, when do you predict the, uh, we can uh, construct the Earth's colony on the moon? In the future, uh, we have a long way to go before we start living on the moon. What what this is is an indication that living on the moon might be possible. And so the first the, the first thing you would want to do is first of all confirm this that we are indeed making the right conclusion from the data. Secondly, to assess is our estimate right? How much is there? Uh, what is its physical state? How much rock is mixed in? Can we get at it? And, and then, you, I, I, to me, that uh, implies a whole sequence of, of robotic missions before you actually send people there. 
but ultimately I, w I would think certainly within the next uh, 50 years someone could be there using this material. Can you update us on what, uh, can you update us on, you, the Colonel mentioned that by the time he got to the office in 1989 it was pretty clear the U.S. wasn't going to deploy a space-based missile <coughs> defense system. What's happened to the Star Wars program? How has how your office changed and what are you using this technology for today? <coughs> Um, although many of the uh, space platforms that were really envisioned as part of the Strategic Defense Initiative Organization program back in 1989 um, have not been supported and continued uh, because of the change in emphasis, uh, including the name of the organization to the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization, uh, we're now primarily focused on theater missile defense and national missile defense, defense of the U.S. Uh, continent and, and uh, and Alaska and Hawaii and are with, uh, with a much reduced threat. Uh, and of course we have the uh, demise of the Cold War to thank for that. Uh, however, there is still a space-borne component to our uh, theater and national missile defense architecture and that is the uh, space-based infrared satellite. Uh, and that will allow us to do tracking, uh, particularly in the boost and in the mid-course phases of the trajectory of a, of a ballistic missile. So all the technologies that were demonstrated on Clementine are technologies that we would hope uh, would be either used or be the, the granddaddies of technologies that we would eventually use in our space surveillance platforms. So that part of the, that part of the space architecture is still very much alive. But the role of the, the so-called Star Wars system now is, is shifted to a more of a surveillance as opposed to shooting something down. No, it's still no. It is still based on uh, shooting down ballistic missiles by impact with the interceptors. Um, so the, this 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 technology is important in order to track and pass the track files on to the interceptors in order for allow, allow them to hit their targets. So it's very much a part of the architecture. Does this mean you'll ask for more money in Congress now that you have found this new discovery? Uh, this I don't I don't think that Congress would be swayed by a discovery of ice in the moon. I think the argument for or against missile defense will stand. And, uh, on its own merits as opposed to uh, whether this uh, satellite has been successful in Set finding ice. time frame. When, when was the uh, radar signal received back uh, by the Clementine from the moon's surface and when was that information returned to Earth? Uh, we did the experiment in uh, April uh, of 1994 and it took us uh, about a year to get the date to really uh, analyze the data. And I'll point out to Chris uh, Lichtenberg over there, who's our uh, RF engineer for from NRL, and then uh, writing up. Then we had the paper. We had the findings basically internally reviewed by some uh, radar experts in September of '95. Went ahead and wrote up a paper, submitted it, got back uh, basically some peer-reviewed suggestions on how to uh, improve the case. Worked some additional, did some additional work through the spring of uh, 1996 and then resubmitted the paper with those corrections and improvements in May of 1996. And then the paper that was published la uh, last week is a result of that. It was accepted. You, the experiment. you got the data back almost at once when right. it was done in April. Okay. Right, exactly. But it took about a year to really analyze it. Let me get some questions from the back. Yeah. Uh, ICE has been found on a number of planetary bodies in the solar system, but there's been some controversy as to the chemical composition of that particular ice. Can you quantify the degree of certainty that this is, in fact, water ice? You can only do it on, by a statistical argument. And the argument I would make is that this ice on the moon comes exclusively from the cometary impact flux. It does not come, it's not, in, it's not indigenous to the moon. Now on Mars you have polar caps and they're made of, of carbon dioxide, but that's indigenous to Mars. Mars has an atmosphere of carbon dioxide. On the moon, this ice is coming from the cometary flux. And most of those comets, the 99% of the mass of a comet is, is water ice. And so uh, that may be a little high. 90% of the mass of a comet is water ice. And, and the other volatile species like methane and ammonia and other volatile elements are in, present in much lower abundance. So that's the argument that it's water ice. Yeah, I'll ask again, can you quantify that in percentages, uh, your degree of certainty? I thought I just did. I, I'm guessing around 90% or so, but, but, but that's a guess, OK? Can I do a follow up on that? When you're talking about ice, we know ice as water that freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of ice is this? Is it freezes the same? Is it sub-zero ice? Uh, is it the kind of stuff I could use in my martinis, or is it a different kind of ice? <laughs> it is, but it might be a, a dirty ice cube for your martini. It, it, it is water ice. It does freeze at, at zero degrees centigrade, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, but it is mixed. It's, it's clathrated, or in other words, with other volatile species, things like methane, things like ammonia. We don't know what the relative proportions are. All we can do is estimate what they are. 
Wouldn't this resource be quite limited, or do you hope this means there's much more ice there, which could support a colony for a long time? Well, if, if there's as much there as, as appears to be from, from this measurement, that would support a pretty significant operation for quite a while. Sir? It wouldn't last forever, but it would be a, it's a significant amount. And do you hope there's much more? Do you hope this means there's much more? Yeah, we didn't actually look into the deepest part of the craters because of the limitation of the geometry, what you can see from Earth. So in the paper, we say this is probably a lower limit to yes. the amount that's there. You talked about a, the, the bright spot in the right. middle of the shadow. What's the size? Is it navigable? What, would it be suitable as a landing it's, site? You know, tens of square kilometers. Okay. So it's... it's yeah, it's, and landing, it's from, from a landing perspective. Uh, and when we had the paper under review, by the way, I had made suggestions that it might be sulfur uh, as well. And actually, one of the reviewers uh, indicated that we probably uh, take that out and say it's water ice is the most probable. So even the peer reviewed folks that looked at the paper made that input. So, so. I, I just want to be clear on the technology that was used to make this discovery. Was it an advanced SDI, BIMDO technology, the antenna and computing equipment, or was it, or could this have been done using regular NASA technology? I might make one point on the technology. Uh, I'll turn it over to Pedro, but the fact that we were able to reprogram the spacecraft so rapidly to do this experiment so quickly and so precisely really is a, a measure of the advanced state-of-the-art hardware and software and the very lean and effective operational uh, capabilities we had with Clementine. We were able to do it basically so quickly and so precisely and actually point the spacecraft this precisely. I'll, I'll turn that rest of that over to Yeah, the answer Pedro. to your question is a very straightforward technology that has been around with us for a long time. This is just basically an S-band signal from a regular antenna, you know, which is lined up with the south pole of the moon and the reflection of that pick up on the Earth with the, deep, with the NASA Deep Space Network. There's nothing new about that. How, how big an object made this crater, and when did that event happen? Okay, the crater we're referring to is actually the rim of the basin, and, and it, you can't actually see the entire feature on this mosaic. The basin rim is basically comes in like this. It's, 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 the basin is called the South Pole Aiken Basin. This is in the press release. It's 2,600 kilometers in diameter. That's about the distance from Houston to Los Angeles. It's about 13, 12 to 13 kilometers deep. That's many times deeper than the Grand Canyon. And an object hitting the moon to form a, a basin crater that big would probably, probably be a small asteroid, probably on the order of three or 400 kilometers in diameter. And, and this formed over four billion years ago. Can you describe how, how long this reflection was recorded? For what period of time was data being gathered? from it, was it a momentary blip that got a blip back, or how? It, a number of minutes. The, the spacecraft goes around in that one orbit in five hours. So if you look at the, the kind of the, the, the angle from uh, one part to the other part, it's, you know, it's a number of tens of minutes. You were shining a beam, right. a radar beam. Right. Like Chris, I don't remember the exact number. We, uh, we you have to come yeah, how, how you okay. This is Chris Lichtenberg, who also assisted us with the... We started the mission about 10 minutes before the spacecraft Speaking of the mic, Go ahead. would come into alignment with the South Pole. We'd continue for about 20 to 30 minutes after that. Uh, so each, each observation was about 30 to 40 minutes or so, uh, and then there was some calibration time before and after this, and then we'd repeat this on several orbits. But I understood this was this recording was made in one pass only, isn't that? No, we did four passes. Okay, we did two passes at the South Pole and two pa passes at the North Pole. But only one of those passes at the South Pole were, were able to exactly illuminate the South the South Pole at the right geometry, and that's the one that showed the signature. How many impacts from how many comets would be required to create the amount of ice needed for 120,000 cubic feet of water? Well, you don't retain all the volume of the, of the cometary mass. A lot of it is, is driven off the moon. Some of the water ends up as vapor that gets dissociated. And uh, you, only, you probably only preserve a very tiny fraction of a given cometary nuclei in, the, in a cold trap. It also has to get in the cold trap, because water on the moon is not stable. The only reason water is present here is because it's in these shadowed areas. So literally, you're, you're, when you ask how many impacts, all the impacts on the moon that were created by comets to some degree or another, contributed to this deposit we're seeing. Some of them may have only contributed an atom or two. Some of them may have contributed a, a huge amount. 
As, as a follow-up question, is there any other material apart from ice that could have created the same reflectance on the radar? Some people have suggested sulfur as a, another possibility, but it's probably um, ice is probably uh, most uh, likely a component. So. <clears throat> We're going to have to terminate the questions right now. Thank you very much for coming. We will be we'll be around. So if you have some questions for specifically, we <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, let, let me just make sure you know, five, ten minutes from now, we'll have a, uh, the regularly scheduled briefing. There are two people back here from the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization, Major Chris Queen and Mr. Rick Lehner. They will be able to give you any of the details you need with regard to spelling of names. Their telephone number, the Public Affairs Office for BMDO, is 703-695-8745. I'll say that one more time. 703-695-8743. And we'll be going in about 10 minutes with Mr. Bacon.